Hello Broadway, I'm standing outside our new foyer entrance off of Maple Avenue. It might not look a whole lot different than when you would have seen it last January or March or whatever, but there's been a massive renovation here. There was um, years of water leakage and rot on the wood and also then carpenter ants came in and, and it was quite a battle for our crew and, and we want to thank Steve Anderson, the chair of our facilities team and his team. They put so many hours of planning and planning and working through complications to make this happen and uh, hired George Kindersley and his crew to, to fix it all. So that little corner there was a lot of two by sixes that had rot. There was a beam up here that was full of rot. Part of the wall along the front of the offices was full of rot. And so there's been beautiful stucco work. So this is our finished product. There are a few more things to do. Um, in the new year, we're gonna have four new doors. They'll be barrier free and accessible. And um, Joanne will be able to let you in right from her office, push, push some buttons here. So this will be easier access into our office and gym area. And we're just, again, just wanna thank the facilities team for their tremendous dedication to this. Thanks. Hello, my name is Janine and I'm part of the lead team here at Broadway. As a church, we want to continue celebrating and sharing the stories about what God is doing among us at Broadway. Today, I want to highlight some of what came out of our lead team physically distant gathering this past weekend in the gym and how we feel God is leading us during this time. As a team, we recognize that communication between us and our ministry teams is vital. To that end, each ministry team has a lead team contact that keeps up with them and in step with their ministry. As we gathered on the weekend, impressed upon us once again was that we need to be creative in our response to keeping our ministries going to the best of our ability during COVID. As the landscape continues to change, we were brainstorming ideas of how to keep our ministries running should the restrictions become stricter for longer. We are doing our best to be forward thinking and want to be responsive, ready to act and responsible in these times. Another portion of our time together was spent talking about our Broadway community and how to keep us connected and encouraged. We are very thankful for the many ways that people have kept up with each other outside the box. To that end, we are looking to put together a more extensive system of caring and connecting for people in church either by phone or outside visits, and would love to see more people within Broadway become a part of this caring ministry. Our heart for Broadway as a lead team is that we would compassionately care for each other and carry each other's burdens. There are so many in this time. So stay tuned for opportunities on how to get involved in this way. Lastly, a very meaningful part of our time together was the sharing of personal testimonies of how God has moved in our lives. There were stories of, oh, I didn't anticipate that change to be so hard. I really had to reframe how I thought about my faith to, wow, I didn't see that coming, but it became clear that God had prepared me for it. Or, and this season reminds me of one that I walked through already. I really need to pray for wisdom on how to navigate it again in these times. To, I've never had such a strong sense of God being with me. To, I feel like I'm in a bit of a desert season, but I know God is here. There were so many seasons of humanity represented among us, but the theme was that they were seasons that were marked by God's abiding presence, even when we couldn't articulate it, and of his beautiful acceptance of our sometimes quite simple offerings. On that note, I would encourage you today to take some time to think about a testimony of God's abiding presence in your life throughout this past season, and just to accept in his presence what this has meant for you. And this doesn't have to be just the good, Maybe it's a season that feels quite unfinished for you, or maybe it is neatly wrapped up and you can articulate it quite well. Whatever it is, I would encourage you to ask God to show you how he has deeply cared for you um, and be encouraged by that. Be encouraged that he will bring things to your mind. Um, we so appreciate your prayers for us as a lead team and are grateful for all the people within the Broadway fold that keep us moving where God is leading. We truly are one body with many parts. Join with me as I pray through a personalized version of Psalm 143, 8 to 10. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Your unfailing love that sees my life, hems me in behind and before, is the anchor of my hope, for I have put my trust in you. My complete trust for this day, for the next, for renewal and beauty, my trust in your strength for my weakness, your leading in these times. Show me the way I should go. Show me how to treat the person in front of me. 
Show me how to forgive. Show me how to believe in your promises. Show me how to live with free joy, for to you I entrust my life. Rescue me from my enemies, Lord, from the fear of what these times will bring, from the restlessness of my soul, from the meaningless pursuits I use to fill the void, for I hide myself in you. Teach me to do your will, to cling to what is good, to have your thoughts be precious to me, to lay down my life in so many ways, for you are my God, my good God forever, who is kind, close, and paying attention. May your good spirit, ever-present and powerful within me, lead me on level ground, the level ground of your goodness and mercy for this day and for the rest. Amen. Good to be with you, Broadway.
Here we are, November 15th, looking at Romans 9.30 to 10.13. Jesus is it. Before we get into Romans, I want to bring our attention to a couple of things. The first thing is a benevolent fund. Uh, we normally have communion once a month in the church, and that's when we take uh, an offering. And this benevolent fund goes towards people in our church and in our community that are in, in great financial need, whether paying a rent, paying gas, paying for groceries. And so we'd love to see um, our benevolent fund uh, increased at this time, especially during COVID and, and some of the strains that families are having. We also are going to, we want to do our annual Christmas hampers. And so where we put a whole big meal together with turkey and potatoes and even some presents and give those to some families uh, in our church and our community. So if you would like to contribute to that, please contact the church office on how you can come in and give funds for that. And it would just be a blessing for so many people in our church and in our community if uh, you were able to do that. Thank you. This pandemic is pushing the limits of our mental health and our mental health resources. I read a great article in the Chilliwack Progress by Paul Henderson this week, and I want to basically quote him verbatim. Uh, tremendous. If you know Paul, uh, you connect with him at all, thank him for his work uh, writing with the progress. He says this, when will COVID end? One of my children sometimes asks, I don't know, but don't worry, we'll get through it together. From anxiety in children to isolation among seniors, depression and frustration and confusion for everyone in between, this pandemic is pushing the limits of our mental health and our mental health resources. Early on, it was dramatic and scary, but part of it was almost a novelty in some ways as we changed the way we behaved. No one could find toilet paper and we banged pots and pans at 7 p.m. to honor our frontline healthcare professionals. Beyond the shocking economic impact, some of it seemed more tolerable because of Dr. Bonnie Henry's calm demeanor as she said daily, it is not forever, but it is for now. But the now of April turned into the still of June, the what really of August, and in October where the hashtag 2020 needs no explanation. There are also early warning signs of measurable health impacts. After many recent years of stability, the rate of antipsychotic use for residents and long-term care has increased 7% during this pandemic. And initial reports from the quarterly assessment show trouble, tre troubling trends in unintended weight loss and worsening of mood among long-term care residents. A study out of the University of British Columbia a month prior found that 41% of nurses reported that they suffered from depression, up from 31% in 2019, pre-pandemic. And 38% said they experienced anxiety compared to 28% last year. Elsewhere, jokes were made about day drinking due to shortened week hours or working from home, but it was and is a serious reality, and it isn't just alcohol. Illicit drug overdose deaths were hitting new highs in the summer, and the numbers are not improving. The mental health 
of not only children up to late teens, but also those in early adulthood is a serious problem. COVID just illustrates the vulnerabilities in society that when any of us are under stress, our coping mechanisms are where we go to, said Dr. Tamina Ali, a Surrey physician, and Paul quotes her. So whether that's getting violent or losing a temper or overeating or using drugs, it's not a surprise to any of us that the overdose deaths are up. It's a sad reality that when we have dysfunctional coping mechanisms, that's what we fall on in periods of stress. Domestic violence numbers too are up. Terrible level, pushing our Ann Davis Transition Society resources to its limits here in Chilliwack. The moves to limit sports and gym attendance may seem like a physical fitness or just a fun issue, but physical fitness and fun too are absolutely crucial to mental health. If mental health was a game of Jenga, despite the best intentions of public health officials, pieces are being pulled out that are critical to the structure and that could cause a collapse. Clinical anxiety has not hit my household bubble yet, Paul says, but nerves can be frayed. E every day, many of us don't all do the right thing, the hard part. Yet that is another day we push the problem down the road, making it even harder. Paul says, as I wrote in this space in July, as cultists was swarming with young people, it continues to be a Sophie's choice every day. Let the kids play with their friends and risk virus transmission or lock them up in the house and risk mental health strain. Everything has to be done to balance these choices. And we have to lean on one another, virtually and metaphorically, as best we can. Let God know your needs. Put yourself in front of his word and let him speak to you through it. Phone a friend. Or hopefully, if you know somebody that could use the phone call, take the courage and phone that person you know that might need some help. To someone to talk to, someone to bear a burden with. And uh, we want to help as a church too. So please let us know. Um, let your care group leader know uh, where we can help, how we can be a part of carrying a burden um, that you have. Last week, we talked about the importance of uh, what God has done for us, that we are now vessels of mercy, and he's the potter and we're the clay, and he turns us into vessels, clay vessels of mercy, uh, where we, we receive mercy from God and we are also to be giving mercy to others. I want to read our scripture for today, Romans chapter 9, verse 30 to chapter 10, verse 13. So if you have your Bible with you, you can read along with me, but here it is uh, out of the NIV. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But Israel, who pursued a law of righteousness, has not attained it. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as it is were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone, as it is written, See, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Brothers, sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they are zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge since they did not know the righteousness that comes from God and sought to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the end of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses described it this way, the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. 
As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Key idea here, never be put to shame. Anyone who trusts in him, the Lord Jesus will never put us to shame. We will not be put to shame. Brene Brown, author of The Gifts of Imperfection, has done research and studies about shame and vulnerability. She says this, shame is the most powerful master emotion. It's the fear that we're not good enough. It's an intensely painful feeling that we are unworthy of love and belonging. We live in a world where most people still subscribe to the belief that shame is a good tool for keeping people in line. Not only is this wrong, it's dangerous. When you experience shame, you know what it is. The Bible says Christ is the one who makes people holy, and those who are made holy are of the same family. And Jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, Hebrews 2.11. God is not ashamed to be called their God, Hebrews eleven sixteen and Hebrews 12, 2. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God wants to deal with our shame. Do you have a shame story or two or three or more? Someone has put you to shame when they come from parents or grandparents or siblings or a child or a spouse, they can rip you apart. Words that make you feel like you did not belong. Words that have crushed you. We belong to Jesus. I've had stories of shame. I won't tell the most vulnerable ones here in public, but I will give you two to give you an idea how it works. When you're ridiculed or insulted, someone shames you. Someone is trying to make you feel like you don't belong. I was in my final year at Bible college wondering what to do next, a ministry job, a summer job, a temporary job maybe that goes on for 10 years, or further schooling. A few of us were sitting around talking about this, and I said, I was thinking of going to Regent College to pursue a master's degree. A guy named Ron Kloss, and I will say, in it, say his name, and there are many that go by this name, he said this to me, Gary, you're not smart enough to go to Regent. How did that make me feel about myself, about belonging to this group of people? Another time, not quite as impactful, was I was golfing with a friend and a total stranger, but my friend knew him. We were talking about golf clubs and different quality of clubs and design. I have a set of Mizuno golf clubs. Basically, there are two types of design, and then, and then you have clubs in between. You can have high forgiveness clubs, you might call them Jesus clubs, <laughs> that when you miss hit a little bit, the outcome is forgiven a little bit. The ball will stay more in line. It, uh, it's a larger sweet spot to hit the little white ball and the weighted in a certain way on the head of the club. Then there are the pro-level clubs that are forged and have less forgiveness. But the advantage of that is they can spin the ball better and you can move your shot left to right or right to left. And you can feel the strike on the ball. And this is what pro players like. They're forged steel and they're for the best. My Mizunos are kind of in between this spectrum, kind of a hybrid. So we are walking down the 16th fairway at Chilliwack Golf Club. And this guy says to me, you're not good enough to play these Mizunos. Wham! <laughs> Shame. I'm not good enough. I don't belong. This shame idea is an interesting concept in the scriptures. God understands shame. God understands the world will try to bring shame on you. He knows that because the cross is foolishness and shameful to the world. That's how it's described. But the believer will not be put to shame. Your existence is secured. You belong to the family of God. You are a brother and sister. You belong. You're good enough. Jesus makes you holy. You are in the family. Paul wants Israel to be saved, not fall, not to be put to shame. They have wrong knowledge. They believe the wrong thing. Paul talks a lot in his letters about believing correctly. It matters, people, what we believe. It's not just about actions. It's about what we believe, and that will cause our actions to be the way they should be. Most of the time, our wrong actions and morals are based on erroneous beliefs. 
So Paul here is already telling us you must believe correctly. The subject is believing and being saved. These ethnic Jews did not submit to God's righteousness because they did not know it. They didn't understand it. They created their own righteousness. They put their own foundation down. They didn't know that Christ is the foundation and Christ is the goal of the law, the end. And it's for anyone and everyone. You see, Israel pursued the law and righteousness incorrectly. The Gentiles, it says here, did not pursue a goal, but they achieved it. <laughs> the Jews pursued a goal, but they failed to achieve it. This is athletic imagery here, and it must be understood as kind of a metaphor of a foot race. The Gentiles were not in the race, but they got the prize. The Jews are running very, very hard, but they stumble over the stone at the end and they fail to get over the finish line. They fail to win. The stone is one of the characteristic references of the early Christian writers. In the Old Testament, there is a series of rather mysterious references to the stone. In Isaiah, it says that God shall become to the houses of Israel a stone one strikes against and a rock that one stumbles over. And that's what they did. Also, Isaiah says, I, I will lay, God says, I will lay a, in Zion a stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. In Daniel, there's references to a mysterious stone. In Psalm 118, 22, the psalmist writes, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. That's Jesus here. He's the chief cornerstone and it's a stumbling block for people. When the Christians began to search the Old Testament for predictions about Christ, they came across these references to this wonderful stone, and they identified Jesus with it. Their justification was the gospel story shows Jesus himself calling himself the stone. He is the stone. In fact, Matthew records in chapter 21, verse 42, Jesus says to the Jews, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the chief cornerstone. So the problem with Israel's zeal, zeal is that it is without knowledge. It's ignorant, lacking discernment, lacking the ability to differentiate the true nature of reality. They misunderstood the stone. They were ignorant on this about how righteousness is attained. The Israelites are seeking to establish their own national righteousness, which excluded all other people. And Jesus saying, no, it's for everyone. Israel here seeks to do God's business. The problem of this seeking is defined by one further contrast. They didn't submit. They didn't order themselves or stand under God's governance here. We must have voluntary subordination. Israel is a people ignorant because it seeks its own exclusive righteousness by refusing to submit to the righteousness of God. Paul, Paul is telling us, stand in line. Jesus is that. How is your race going? Messiah Jesus on the cross takes, takes on sin. He defeats sin once and for all. You need to know that. We can be freed from sin's oppressive reign. We can continue in the race. Israel wants to confine the grace and righteousness of God to themselves, keep it to themselves. They pursued the, they pursued the law by works, and that would distinguish them from other people. They didn't understand God's saving of the entire world through Christ. The law is not an evil that Christ might bring to an end. No, the law is good, it says. It's righteous. God gave Israel at Sinai the law to guide them, to help them be a witness to the nations. It was good. Israel's problem was not the law, but the way they pursued it. The law is a good goal as long as the race is continued by faith rather than by works. So it's a race of faith, so to speak, not a race of works. Paul speaks of his anguish toward his fellow Israelites. Perhaps he was warding off the Gentile readers. Maybe the Gentile readers took delight in Israel's failure. <laughs> we sometimes can delight in others' failures, especially when arrogant or pompous or privileged people fail. We might try to shame them. Perhaps the Gentiles are doing this. All well, those Israelites deserved it. They don't feel sorry for them. They were born with a silver spoon in their mouth. It serves them right. They got what they deserved. Perhaps the Gentiles were trying to Shame the Jews, and Paul is saying, no, they, need, they will get saved. We want them to be saved. This is a magnificent promise that the Messiah gives to all people, Jews and Gentiles. Despite their zeal, Israel lacks knowledge. Knowledge in the sense of both awareness and assent to the divine saving action in Jesus, the Messiah. 
He is the cornerstone. The cornerstone is Jesus, not our own righteousness. So don't stumble over this, Israel. You've pursued righteousness the wrong way. By acts of Torah obedience, by pursuing this line of action, you've demonstrated your ignorance of how God delivers people through the Messiah. The reason why Israel is wrong to try to establish their own righteousness and wrong for not submitting to God's righteousness is then explained here. He says Christ is the end of the law or the goal of the law, the, the beautiful result of the law, so that there's righteousness for everyone who believes because it's all about Christ. The Messiah has brought the law to its intended goal, namely the new covenant in my blood, as he expressed it. By doing so, Christ terminates the law as the mechanism for relating to God so that righteousness is now available to all on the basis of faith and not on the basis of performing works of the law. Thus, to pursue righteousness through Torah observance is wrong because it's futile. It's like trying to spend your Target gift card at the new Savon store at the Cottonwood Mall that is on the old Target building. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> The Torah, the law, is a prophetic pointer to the gospel. Faith upholds the Torah, while life in the Spirit, will read, fulfills the Torah. The gift of Torah, the gift card of Torah, has been replaced by the gift card of Christ. And he says, Jesus is Lord. This title is perhaps the best explanation of what it means for you and I to be a follower of Jesus, a Christian. A Christian is someone who professes to live under submission of King Jesus and believes that God has acted in Jesus to usher in this age that we're in now. Paul writes these words to a cluster of house churches in the heart of the Roman Empire, living right under the emperor's nose, and boldly declaring the lordship of a Jewish man executed by the Romans as a common criminal. And so Paul tells us, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. This is the basis of, a, of an early Christian creed. The word for Lord here uh, was a key word uh, at the time. It was a title given to Roman emperors, it was a title given to Greek gods and placed before the God's name. They were Lord. In the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, it is the regular translation of the divine name Yahweh or Jehovah, Lord. It's who we believe. It's who we trust. And we must have an utter, utter belief in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. So we are calling him Jesus, Lord, not the emperor. It's God. He is to have the supreme place in our life. And we pledge him obedience and worship. To call Jesus Lord was to count him unique and Lord among all lords. We must believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. The resurrection was an essential of Christian belief. Christians must believe not only that Jesus lived, but also that he lives. He's risen from the dead. We must not only know about Christ, we must know him. And we can now because he's alive. We're not just studying a figure of history history. It's a real person with a real presence in our life. Christ is the victor. That's who we know and continue to want to know. But we must not only believe in our hearts, we must confess with our mouth. Christianity is belief plus confession. It involves witness before others. Our fellow human beings, we need to know what side we're on. Jesus is Lord. The Jews would find it hard to believe that the way to God was not through the law. It was a way of trust and acceptance. It was foolishness to them, even scandalous, this cross idea. This word Lord is also provocative because the Roman Empire was the one who was hailed as Lord by everyone across the empire. At the time that Paul writes this, you could see this inscriptions all over the place on pottery and on papers. Nero is Lord. Nero, the Lord of the entire world. And Paul is saying, no, Jesus is Lord. He means what he says. He's been a deliberate social political protest perhaps here against the propaganda of the Roman Empire. Maybe. But at least we should acknowledge that the claim was potentially treasonous and could be perceived as politically disloyal. 
To claim that Jesus is Lord on Lord Nero's own turf was not going to endear the Christians to the empire. Isaiah 28, 16, Paul quotes, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. The reason Paul is not ashamed of the gospel, chapter 1, verse 16, is because the gospel declares that God has reversed the verdict of anyone who might try to shame his people. Whereas some detractors might have alleged that Christian faith is shameful in what it implied about God and Israel and Torah and other Greek religions and the Roman Empire, Paul says that those who confess such a faith, in fact, abound in honor before God, he, we will not be put to shame. So Paul here, in the last few weeks we've read, has taken us from Abraham to the Exodus, to the exile, to covenant renewal, to the inclusion of the Gentiles. The Messiah has come and acted to end the exile and to bring renewal to us. Jews and Gentiles can be justified by confession of Jesus as Lord together. This is a message that has spread to the inhabited world. It's met with mixed results. But the upshot is that Gentiles are entering into the heritage of Israel, even while Israel herself does not have the eyes to see it. So Paul prayed that they would see it. They've missed the boat and they're throwing rocks at it. And Paul's saying, this is not the way to go. N.T. Wright provides a good synopsis of the kind of story that Paul is telling us here in this chapter. It's the story of how people who had no heirs, no graces of their own, no thought of being sought by Israel's God, the Creator, nevertheless find themselves grasped by the divine call and love as an act of sheer grace. That's what God's done for us. It's also the story of the shock received by the people who thought that God was only for them, and they would, the one, they would come out on top. The end result of their own history was Messiah, who from their point of view was, as it were, an anti-Messiah. He couldn't have been the Messiah. That's what they thought. The king came, and instead of setting his people free, their idea here of the Messiah, he died a death. How do you follow someone who died? Only if they do so will they find fulfillment of their own story. They need to see that Jesus is the true king, the world's true Lord, and he gives salvation to all who call on his name. The Gentile Christians in Rome probably did not get the complete significance of all of Paul's Old Testament citations in here, and there's many of them. Nonetheless, they probably had an aha moment after hearing Romans 9 and 10 when Phoebe read it to them. Careful reflection on these words would provide them with a better grasp of why most Jews have rejected the message and how this relates to God's purposes to bring Gentiles into the inheritance of Israel. Paul has given them a, a lesson here. But they might ask, does that mean that God has now rejected Israel? That, we'll talk about that more next week. That Gentile believers can consider themselves to be superior now to Israel? So Paul is saying, no, you are not superior to Israel. You're all together in this. They are not completely cut off. Paul gives an emphatic no to all these questions. It certainly looks as if Paul has given Israel a hard time for their failure to believe. And he even leaves their position before God up in the air. Yet Paul only emphasizes Israel's failure at such length so that Israel's salvation will appear all the more striking. Israel's reconciliation will serve to magnify the depths of God's mercy and the constancy of God's faithfulness towards Israel. He is a God of mercy. So as we read this, we need to read it through what people call a Jesus lens. Romans 9 to 11 is dense with manifold citations, allusions, and echoes of the Old Testament. Romans as a whole has about 65 or so direct citations of the Old Testament in it, and half of them, 30, 30 plus, are in Roman, these three chapters, Romans 9, 10, 11. Paul isn't blindly pulling out passages from the left and the right, just throwing them at his audience with the hope that they won't actually look any of them up. For Paul, the Old Testament provided the substructure of his theology. Paul believed that his gospel was pre-promised. He didn't make it up. And even authorized by the narrative of Israel's scriptures. The way Paul utilizes passages like Habakkuk and in Genesis and Isaiah, it illustrates his belief that the gospel is conformed to the pattern of scripture from Genesis onward. The Old Testament points to Jesus. We need to know how the Bible fits together. Paul's doing that for us. How the Old and New Testaments provide a singular testimony to God, the kingdom, Jesus, the cross. 
It's a crash course in biblical theology here in three chapters. All of God's promises to Israel receive their fulfillment in Christ, 2 Corinthians 1.20. For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. Acts 13, verse 32. We tell you the good news. What God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Christ. The promises of a new covenant, a new restored people of God, a new dwelling place of God among people, all are fulfilled in Christ and the gospel events. This is Christ's word. It brings power, substance, conviction, and authority to the hardened heart. It works on the broken heart and the wounded heart and the proud heart and the foolish heart and the repentant heart. The word of God is a sword with authority. It judges the self-righteous. It justifies the ungodly. God's word never fails because it is God's word. It's infallible. It's enduring. It's effective because the spirit gives conviction and truth. And Christ is the subject received in faith by the hearers of the word. God's word is power and weakness. What we want most of all, what we need most of all, is to know that Christ loves us and died for us and cares for us. We'll be never, we will never be put to shame. The best thing I can offer you is Christ. The best thing you can offer to anyone is Christ. That is what Paul is doing for the believers in Rome. It's about Jesus. You need to come to some truthful conclusions that it's all about Jesus. We read earlier, Christ is God over all. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who is and who was and who was to come, the Almighty. We read that in Revelation. Here, Paul draws a contrast between two ways of relating to God. There was the Jewish way, and the aim of the Jews was to set themselves right with God, and they regarded a right relationship with God as something which could be earned. There is another way to put that, which will show what it really means. Fundamentally, the Jewish idea was that individuals, by strict obedience to the law, could pile up a credit balance. And God, like, owed them. <laughs> the result would be that God was in their debt and he owed them salvation. But it was obviously a losing battle because human imperfection could never satisfy, satisfy God's holy perfection. Nothing they could do could even begin to repay what God has done for them. That's why everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's about giving your heart. That is why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. They did not believe in the one who was there to save them. Paul was entirely ready to admit that the Jews were zealous for God. He says that. But he also saw that their enthusiasm was misdirected. This Jewish religion was based on meticulous obedience to the law. Take the Sabbath law. It was laid down exactly how far anyone could walk on the Sabbath. It was laid down that a burden which weighed more than two dried figs must not be lifted. They wanted to go for, for perfection. It was laid down that no food must be cooked on the Sabbath. It was laid down and in the event of sickness, measures might be taken to keep patients from becoming worse, but not make them better. This is how they tried to obey what they understood the law to be. The way of the law was not easy. Jesus said, you are giving people heavy burdens with your interpretation of the law. Remember the seven woes from chapter 23 of Matthew? Jesus said, you tie up heavy loads and you put them on people's shoulders. He called these Jewish leaders blind guides. That's not the kind of guide runner you need for your race. We need Jesus. Some cross-country races for elementary age kids have a front runner that will lead the pack to make sure they do not get lost. That's what Jesus is doing. He's running ahead of us, with us. He said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. The Jews were and still are zealous. Paul had no difficulty in granting that. But their enthusiasm and their single-mindedness were misdirected and misapplied. And they were not going the proper direction of the race. The whole Jewish approach was that. Obedience to the law, they would earn credit with God. Nothing shows better the Jewish attitude than the three classes into which they divided people. There were those who were good, those whose balance was on the right side. There were those who were bad, those whose balance was on the debit side. And there were those who were in between, who by doing one more good work, maybe could become good. You could move over. Jesus saying, no, I've done all that needs to be done. It's a matter. It's not a matter of your achievement. Paul said this, Christ is the end of the law. He is the goal of the law. What he meant is Christ is the end of this legalism. 
The relationship between God and his people is no longer a relationship between a creditor and a debtor, between an earner and an assessor, between a judge and a criminal waiting to receive judgment. Because of Jesus Christ, we're no longer faced with the task of satisfying God's justice by our works. We need only to accept his love. We no longer have to win God's favor. We need simply to take the grace and love and mercy which he freely gives. It is finished, Jesus said. The race is finished. And Jesus says, jump into the victory pool here with me. The Messiah is the new stone for a renewed people of God, made up of believing Jews and Gentile. Jesus finished the race for us. He has fulfilled the goal of the law. The law could not take us over the finish line. Jesus takes us over the finish line. And he says, I took the cup. It is finished. Everyone who trusts in him will not be put to shame. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. In grace, my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed, my chains are Forever
mine will be forever mine. You are forever mine. So as you read these scriptures and listen to what was said, uh, probably a couple things come to mind. What's your experience of shame? And think about what that does to you and is against you. And I, I would say, read through these scriptures, do some journaling, and ask God to show, show you that he eliminates your shame, that he personally wants to connect with you. He is a living, the living Christ. We worship a living Lord, and he wants to connect with you. As you read through this and is, is just to be thinking about how does this relate to what's going on in my life this week? What areas maybe have I been put to shame and I need to realize, no, I'm in the race. God is for me. Who can be against me? Who can bring words to bring me down when I have the words of Christ that lift me up? And so something like this has deep theology, but Paul has some great practical stuff in here. He's telling us, we call on the name of the Lord. We will never be put to shame. Confess it with your mouth. Say it out loud about who you are, whose you are. You are a child of God. You will never be put to shame. 